Victor. And we are now live, so over to you, Ken. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, delighted that we can all meet this afternoon. My name is Ken Giller. I'm a professor of plant production systems here in Wageningen University. I'm sitting behind my desk to chair this uh, conference today. Just some words of background. So the conference is basically entitled Responding to Fall Armyworm in Africa. And we're organizing this under the auspices of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Here in Wageningen, we help to chair the thematic network under the SDSN on sustainable agriculture and food systems. So I'm actually the co-chair of that group together with uh, Akin Doberman, the director at Rothamsted in the UK, and with Rebecca Nelson from Cornell. And we basically helped to write a report on this topic ahead of the uh, announcement of, uh, of the SDGs, so we contributed to that process. And once the SDGs were uh, actually formally announced and agreed on, um, we were asked jointly then to take forward this idea of uh, a thematic network under the SDSN, really to support work around SDG2. So that focuses, of course, on zero hunger and sustainable production systems. As a, one of the discussions that we were having under the network with a number of colleagues, we were particularly concerned about the status of fall armyworm in Africa. Uh, we'll hear more about the details from the experts uh, later. I can't claim to be an expert at all on fall armyworm, but we, uh, we do work very actively from my group in, in Africa. And fall armyworm was really uh, very alarming. I mean, we heard lots of stories of huge crop losses, of huge infestation across Africa occurring very quickly. And we really felt it was time to hear some updates on what was going on. We understand actually that there are a whole number of different conferences taking place and activities on fall army work. But we chose this medium in particular, this medium of a, what we call a carbon free conference, not least because we can save on all those air miles and uh, carbon emissions, but particularly because we can make this available to people throughout Africa to participate. So people who are really involved with the problem can uh, hopefully sit behind their desks and actually join this conference uh, across the continent. We have currently uh, just under 500 people who've signed up for the conference, so we're delighted at the response, and over 70% of those participants who've signed on are actually from different African countries, are based actually in Africa. So I think so far, we've uh, definitely achieved that goal of being able to contact a very wide audience. The format of the conference then is that we'll take place over five days. Um, each day we've got an hour and 10 minutes to an hour and a half uh, with two or three different uh, experts talking on different topics. And then uh, at the end of each session, we've got a 20 minute uh, discussion period. You're, all of you who are following the conference are uh, welcome and uh, invited, please, to send in your questions for the, um, the speakers. Those uh, questions will be collated and moderated by two people who are online with us. One's uh, Lauren Beredo, who's uh, online from uh, the United States, and Lauren helps to, uh, with coordination for the SDSN. And also then uh, Linda Veldhausen, who you've no doubt uh, been in touch with already, uh, because Linda's been in charge of setting up the conference uh, to date. And, and thanks very much for, for Linda to making that happen. Uh, before we proceed with the first talk, I'd like to hand over to Linda for a few uh, housekeeping uh, uh, issues and uh, arrangements in relation to questions. So over to you, Linda. Yes, thank you, Ken. So, yeah, indeed, very exciting that we're getting started now. It took us a few months to get this going and really happy that everyone is here. Um, so, as you all know, we have an online platform that runs parallel to this e-conference. And in case you haven't received a link for this, please get in touch with me and I'll send you a link to join this platform. Because on this platform, now we have close to 500 participants. And as Ken said, many people from Africa and working in Africa. 
And many of these people have already introduced themselves. So you can log in on the community and see who's there. And perhaps there's someone in the region where you work that you can connect with. And other things you can do on this online platform is to share ideas, discuss today's session, pose general questions you have, share work and see what others are up to. So after this session, please go online and join this community again. And for those of you who are on Twitter, you can use the hashtag for Armyworm eConference to share your thoughts and insights with the world. So that's it for now, and back to you, Ken. Well, thanks very much, Linda. So the great thing about this conference as well is that for those people who are outside Africa and, and on different time zones, that it can be watched afterwards. You can watch back on YouTube. So the, uh, the conference is being recorded and can be used as a resource for other people. So without further ado, uh, we're a bit ahead of time, but I'd like to introduce the first speaker. So the first speaker is Dr. Peter Chinwanda from ITA. He's uh, based in Lusaka. So Peter's uh, an entomologist, academic consultant. He's been working 20 odd years on insect pest management in field and in storage pests on a whole range of, of cests and lately on, on uh, fall armyworm. So Peter's going to talk to us on fall armyworm identification and infestation. Over to you, Peter. So please unmute yourself and then you can take over. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks, uh, Ken. Okay, as you heard, um, I'm Peter Chinwada. I work for IITA and I'm based at the Southern African Research and Administration Hub uh, in Lusaka, Zambia. Uh, I started working mid-September uh, 20, 2018. Uh, so in my position at IITA, I'm the Forum and Compact Leader. Uh, this uh, is the technologies for African agricultural transformation, that is African Development Bank uh, initiative, uh, Feed for Africa. So I'm going to briefly talk about the forum and identification and how we can recognize it from field infestations, particularly in maize agroecosystems. Uh, this is a pest which is a very wide host range, but in Africa we find that uh, its main preference is on maize. And for a good reason, we have so many of our inhabitants uh, who have maize as a staple food crop. So that's where the greatest impacts are. So my outline of the presentation, I'll just briefly uh, introduce uh, my talk and then move on to follow my identification proper. So I'll look at how I'll briefly uh, outline how we can identify follow based on the adult stages uh, and then the eggs, the larvae, and then particularly uh, how most of us uh, try to diagnose uh, fall armyworm, that is from field infestations. And then I will conclude my talk. So we have fall armyworm which came into Africa uh, first recorded in early 2016, but uh, evidence shows that it probably might already have been here for even a year longer than 2016. So it came in and with a heap of other biotic constraints. So in particular, I am just going to focus on a few ways we have maize little necrosis. And uh, I'm happy that uh, probably we've managed uh, to contain that to some extent. We also have larger grain borer uh, on the storage side, then gray leaf spot disease, that is Secospora zemaidis, then maize trick virus uh, being vectored by insects as well. Then stem borers. Uh, and in drought situations, in addition to stem borers, we, all have, we also have major problems from termites. So a lot of now we have our farmers now having to contend with all these pests. Prior to the advent of fall armyworm, we really did not bother much to scout our maize fields. But now there's need for that paradigm shift to ensure that farmers really scout their fields in order to identify or diagnose the pest problem early and take action. So on the adult stages, 
uh, we, we would actually feel that this is something which particularly our crop protection practitioners, uh, the extension workers and search technicians should be able to mount their adult specimens to check for the uh, taxonomic characters which are used to identify four lime worms. So on the four wing, on the extreme, or on the tip, we have a large, almost triangular shaped whitish mark. And then in the middle of the four wing, we have just a whitish, a small whitish mark. So these are the features which we can utilize to identify four lime but this is only from the male moth, not from the females. So most of the time we find farmers content not necessarily with moths, but uh, with eggs. Though, of course, for the moths now, when we go for the community-based uh, pheromone monitoring, people should be able to actually be able to identify the moths. So for the eggs, uh, from afar, normally what you see is just some whitish or fluffy uh, material, uh, kind of roundish, and uh, that those are the eggs. And if you look at them closely, uh, especially using hand lens or my camera, you may actually see the initial egg masses covered by hairs. And depending on the stage, uh, when they are close to hatching, the hairs uh, which are left over by the female are moth, turn kind of grayish. So for the larvae themselves, normally uh, we have uh, six instars, but in some cases we may actually just have five. So for the first level instars, which are still grouped together uh, at the site of etching, uh, these uh, are characterized by large uh, dark heads. And we have several, uh, I would just call them elevated uh, dark spots, which are spiny, so they've got hairs. And farmers can easily confuse these uh, with chylo species. So one of the most widely distributed in Eastern and Southern Africa is Kylo Patelas. So in Zimbabwe, when Folamon came in October, it was misidentified as Kylo Patelas, mainly because people were looking at the early level instance of Folamon. But however, a lot of our identifications, we base them on the medium to late insta stages, where we have the features which people are most familiar with. So on the front part of the head, there is an inverted Y-shaped whitish mark. So that is very characteristic, but you need to use it in combination with four distinct uh, raised bumps or tubercles on the last abdominal segments. So these are arranged in a square-like pattern. But on the other abdominal segments, you actually also find four smaller dots that are arranged like a trapezium. So in terms of coloration of the larvae, the, the, the coloration varies. Most of them are from brownish to greenish, but you also have some palish, creamish colors. Uh, and so you need to look uh, at those characters I described rather than color. However, if you check maize, particularly at the stages where we have tassels as well as silks and uh, developing cobs, you may encounter uh, helicophepa as well. And if you are to look just at the inverted Y sheet mark, you may misidentify the helicophepa as fall annual. So you need to look at more features. But uh, if you look closely uh, at what I'm projecting on the screen, the helicophepa, it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, I've got those hairs, whereas uh, fall annual is kind of smoother. So most of our farmers uh, do not really go to the extent of looking uh, for the actual adult stages, uh, as well as the larval stages. So even our pest scouts, they normally uh, give their diagnosis based on the injury symptoms. So it's a major, major challenge, particularly now, where we have many other confounding uh, injury symptoms uh, due to other insect pests. So notably, stem borers. And I found in Madagascar, we also have major problems from maize leaf rollers. So those ones can also be problematic in terms of, and you can lead to a cross 
overstatement of fall hormone infestation levels. So however, so I'm just going to outline the injury symptoms which we can utilize or make use of to make uh, our diagnosis uh, in the field. So initially on very young seedlings, we can have cutworm-like damage, and then the cartilage window panes, pinholes and short holes on leaves, then what I have put in in bold, ragged and torn leaves, that is a major catalyst of fall hormone damage. Then destruction of the growing point, old ears, and then I've also put in bold presence of egg masses. One needs to check for this, as well as presence of fall hormone laughing. So for me, I found it useful to base my diagnosis on ragged and torn leaves, presence of egg masses, as well as presence of laughing. But the, the, the presence of egg, egg masses are very, very difficult to actually find. So most cases, what people contend with are the presence of the larvae, as well as those symptoms on the leaves. So cutworm-like damage. So when the young seedlings are attacked, you find the growing point is just cut off. And beside the young seedling, one can actually find the fallen larvae themselves. So this may lead to a lot of gap filling. Or in worst case scenarios, you can actually uh, need, to, you need to replant the entire maize field. And that is a cost to farmers, especially when they've already put in uh, basal compound fertilizers. So window panning is one of the symptoms which turns out even from afar. But however, I've deliberately put the window panes, not due to fall hormone, but due to others. So I put to the left stem borers and then uh, leaf rollers. And for many stem borers and fall hormone, probably the prominence of many pinholes may lead one to conclude that is fall hormone. So you need to also to check for the presence of eggs. Otherwise, you will record fall hormone window panes as being those, those due to fall hormone. Then the pinholes and short holes. You also have uh, stem borers causing this. But however, this picture I took it from the damage caused by uh, fall anyone. So you have a neat, uh, those round holes in a line. And these, are, these, uh, these leaves are damaged when they are still rolled up in the funnel. And when they unroll, you see a series of those uh, holes. Then the ragged and torn leaves. This is what most people are familiar with. Stem borers do not cause that kind of damage. Yes, they feed on leaves a bit, but normally they then the later instars then tunnel into the stems. So the, we also have the growing point being destroyed. Uh, that is something which one needs to check uh, always for, but normally. Uh, that may necessitate a bit of destructive sampling. But with experience, you do not really need to destroy the plant. You may just destroy a bit of the, a, a few of the rolled up leaves in order to expose the larva feeding inside. Then tassel and silks damage. So when we have the rolled up leaves, the rolled up leaves are in the late wool stage and the tassel developing inside, if you open the tassels, those rolled up leaves, you can clearly see fall and larva feeding inside. And then on the on the silks, uh, this was a picture I took in Madagascar when before it had caused so much damage. But you start seeing uh, the silks being shaped off. And in no time, you find that larva penetrates the developing ear. Then we have old ears. So this may actually differ. You may actually find just a neat round hole and the lava is gone in. But sometimes you may find a few of the husks get chewed before the lava tunnels. And if you open, you can clearly see the lava fitting inside. And you one needs to actually to open because helicopter can also cause that kind of damage as well as stem borers. So I just, uh, to wind up, I'm focusing on the presence of eggs and oral larvae. So when one checks for eggs, uh, it depends. Most of the insects are in order to lessen uh, chances of desiccation 
they prefer to lay their eggs on the lower part of the leaves. But they can be deposited even on the upper as well as on the stems. And on pre-tassel maize, we usually have one larva because of cannibalism. But uh, if you grow maize off season, when they do not have an option of so many fields to choose from, you can find up, upwards of five larvae feeding on one plant. But on early planted maize, you find fallam larvae can be found feeding alongside the stem borer larvae. This is the situation we're finding now in Southern Africa, because the fallam populations at this time of the year have not built up. So you have stem borer larvae developing alongside fallam larvae. But once you fallam them in large numbers, the stem borers kind of disappear. So this is what you see uh, earlier on when they can coexist on one uh, tassel. You may find Folam and Fidu on one side, and then Busiola Fusca or Kylopatellas feeding from the other end. So in conclusion, I would want to say when one wants to make proper diagnosis of uh, Folam, you one needs to be aware of what one may encounter if the assessment is done during the main growing season or off season. During the main growing season, you know you need to contend with stem borers as well. So you need to check, not just plant injury symptoms, but you also need to confirm presence of eggs and or larvae. So just before I leave uh, that aspect of eggs, if we also have happen to have an outbreak of African animal, Spodoptera exemptor, then those eggs, you need to actually check to, to actually incubate them until they hatch, because then that may be African animal as well, not fall animal. So by far, the scariest part of fall animal in terms of the damage symptoms is when we see those erect and torn leaves. So, but however, we can also see dry frost. And that uh, slide clearly illustrates what happens. And in most cases, uh, I wouldn't advise anybody to spray. You are just wasting your chemical when the damage is that intense. But however, uh, especially with regards to people, to scouts, as well as extension workers who are tasked uh, with assessments of uh, incidents of fall armyworm, as well as infestation levels, you want, they need to be aware that leaf damage symptoms are permanent. So when collecting such data, you need to look at fresh injury symptoms, as well as presence of larvae. And here I haven't put egg masses uh, in bold because most of our people do not have the time to check for eggs. So normally they try to base on the presence of larvae. So in brief, that's what I had for uh, my presentation. Thank you for listening. Well, thanks very much indeed, uh, Peter, uh, for that very clear presentation. I think, you know, some really uh, shocking pictures of, of damage that you showed. Um, I was just looking at the, the questions coming in. And, uh, maybe, Peter, if you could uh, put your screen sharing off so we can see you yeah. in person. There are some very specific questions on identification that maybe would be sensible for us to, uh, to address straight away. Um, so, a first one would be uh, from Francis Abala. How do you differentiate male uh, fall army worm from females based on the wings and, and the abdomen? Okay, uh, for when it's... Okay, I'm trying to, to remove... Oh, there we are, yeah, we see you again. Okay, so when you, you, you try to look at the, the... to differentiate between the males and the females, Normally, the, the females, you can only get them when you actually get collect pupae and incubate them. Because for, for the pheromone traps, these pheromone traps are selective. They only catch the males. Okay. So people rarely come across the females until they actually check to collect the pupae. So the, the females themselves do not have any particular identification characters. But they do not have all those white, those markings which I showed. That triangular white marking at the tip, as well as uh, that one at the center of the forewing. So the female does not have that. Okay. So there's there's another question: is um, 
is where, where would you find the eggs most often? You were talking about needing for, to look for, for eggs, and uh, the question is, well, where, where would you look? Ken, it's, it's so funny. Um, until I went to Madagascar in, in March this year, I was always finding the egg masses of fall underneath the, the, the leaves. But when I went to Madagascar, 50% of the time I was finding the eggs on the upper surface of the leaves. Mm. So it was very easy to see, and I'm still wondering why it was happening that way. Yeah, but you can also see them on the stems. So another uh, quite specific question, um, again, is how, how would you measure the levels of infestation in maize fields? So considering eggs, larvae, and adults. So I, I guess the question is, are there, are there scoring systems for uh, assessing the level of um, infestation? Yes, one can use some scoring system, but uh, normally if you score, you are trying to look at um, pest severity. But for level of infestation, it, normally people want to base it uh, on the presence of symptoms. But for somebody who already knows, like I have already outlined these other confounding symptoms, you need to base infestation on the presence of fresh injury symptoms but you need to also to confirm what pest is present. If now I'm to do an assessment like in Zimbabwe now, I just focus on the window panes and all sorts of um, pinholes. Probably what I may actually be recording as folamum is just temporous. So you need to check to see whether the, the folamum is actually present or not. Okay, so, so that, yes. yeah, one, one last specific question on, on uh, Identification scouting is from Norman uh, Muzinji. The question is, what, at what stage would farmers start scouting for fall armyworm in their fields during the growing season? Okay, it depends on how early or, or, or say on the planting uh, date of that crop. So if it's an early planted crop, uh, you need to scout, uh, from my experience, uh, probably from two weeks after crop emergence, you need to scout. Or even a week after crop emergence, uh, remember I mentioned cutworm damage. It happens on the very or newly emerged uh, maize plants. So if you miss that period, you may actually re 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 uh, end up replanting the entire field. But when we have the main rains uh, and then there is a lot of simultaneous planting over a wider area, uh, you may actually find the infestations are diluted over large areas. So you find farmers may start scouting even four weeks. But as a rule of thumb, I might say you need to scout right from the first week of emergence. On late planted crops, your late planted crop becomes like a, it stands out as an island on its own. So your fall arm coming in even from the first week of emergence as well. So for fall arm, you need to scout from week one after emergence. Okay, well thanks very much indeed uh, there, uh, Peter. Um, comments coming in as well from Daniel Lacapo. Beautiful presentation, very educative with beautiful pictures, so thanks very much. Um, I'd like to move on now, and maybe we'll come back to you later, Peter, with more questions in the general discussion. But I'd like to move on now to the second presentation for today. Um, and that's uh, from uh, Frédéric Bardron from CIMIT. So Fred's based at CIMIT in Zimbabwe. Um, he's an agronomist with wide experience of working on uh, wheat and maize systems uh, throughout the East African highlands, particularly Ethiopia, Rwanda, but also extensive experience in uh, Zimbabwe. And uh, Frederick's going to be talking to us today on understanding the factors conditioning fall armyworm infestation in African smallholder maize fields and quantifying the impact on yield. So Fred, if you could unmute yourself and uh, come online and we'll hand over to you. Yes, can you hear me? Perfectly, yeah. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Ken. So I'm sharing my screen. I'm hoping you can see. Fine. If you just click on that hide button, you'll take that uh, message from Google Hacks. So, perfect. Thanks. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'm going to present some uh, results of a study we've collected um, uh, the past season in Zimbabwe. 
you can see there's a number of co-authors to this study, including Peter, who just, uh, just spoke. So the point of this study is really to uh, try to see in small order uh, conditions uh, what's the impact of fall armyworm on yield and if there is any management practices that condition uh, this level of infestation. So of course we know that investing in uh, chemical pesticides has been the immediate reaction of African governments when uh, the invasion of fall armyworm started. We know this remains the main strategy of small orders, but the results are already mixed. Uh, we also know that uh, we would like perhaps more agronomic management options, which present like a large potential for minimizing impact on, on health as well as on the environment. But there's very little data available uh, on how to do that. Most of the data actually we are using in trainings in a uh, full army one management in Africa are based on uh, evidence from the Americas as well as some observations which 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 sometimes are already anecdotal, you know, not really um, scientifically based or really documented scientifically. Uh, we know also that the yield impact of fall armyworm has been reported as very large. So if we look at uh, the study from Day and colleagues and Kumela and colleagues, you know, this is somewhere between 22 and 67 percent in Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya and Zambia. But we have to recognize that these estimates are based on farmers' perception. You know, it was collected through a uh, farm survey and not through rigorous field scouting methods such as uh, the one proposed by uh, McGrath and colleagues uh, and adopted by most uh, task forces on, uh, on fall armyworm. So as I said, the objectives of this study was really to uh, quantify fall armyworm infestation uh, of small older maize field in two uh, districts in Zimbabwe, in eastern Zimbabwe, following a rigorous scouting protocol, not through uh, survey data and try to understand if there is any uh, factors conditioning this fall armyworm infestation, you know, be it intercropping, planting date, fertilization, etc. Uh, one more time, on small order conditions, not on trials. And then the final objectives was to quantify yield losses due to fall armyworm infestation. We collected data from uh, 791 plots in those two districts. Uh, in February for the district of Chipinge and uh, in March for the district of Makoni, after training uh, extensionists uh, to do so. We used uh, this sort of recognized method published by uh, McGrath and colleagues. Uh, you can find it on, uh, on, uh, on the manual published by uh, USID and, and, and CIMIT. So using a W uh, sampling method with five sampling points, as you can see here, uh, displayed on a W uh, shape, and uh, we counted 10 plants, basically, and how many of these plants were uh, displaying damage due to uh, uh, displaying leaf damage, how many of them were uh, displaying thrust in the world. And uh, we also scored each of these five points along this W uh, sampling frame uh, using the Davis scale. So this is the sort of Davis scale that is, uh, that is, uh, that is used. So it's like really a score from one to nine one being like a very um, healthy plant with no visible uh, damage due to fall army worm, and nine being like extreme uh, damage uh, due to fall army worm, and of course two to eight with damages in between. And with a subsample of this uh, 791 field, about 20% of them, we assessed uh, precisely yield using a protocol developed by uh, some of my colleagues in CIMIT and published in uh, Makanza and colleagues 2018, using uh, image uh, recognition to basically establish uh, properly uh, yield in those feed and correlated to this uh, yield damage we measured earlier. So here are some of the results. You can see on the diagonal of this, uh, of this figure, uh, the density distribution of damage using these three uh, proxies of infestation, leaf damage, frost in the world, and damage score. And you can see the correlation between uh, those different proxies uh, plotted in the bottom triangle and the correlation coefficient on the upper triangle. So you can see that this is very correlated, although we find some sort of different infestation level if we use leaf damage, about 48%, or thrust in the wall, about like 32%, or damage score, about 35% of damage. So in fact, the proxy that you're using is important, and I will talk about it again later. Now, if we compare, uh, if we look at these three proxies for the three districts, we can see like uh, infestation was slightly higher in Makoni. Uh, one more time, different uh, different uh, percentage would be found if we use a uh, propor proportion of leaf damage, proportion of thrust in the world, or damage score. 
And now this is the result of a multivariate model that we run, like using a beta regression. So trying to uh, test for different uh, uh, variables that could condition uh, for lamellar infestation. On this particular uh, dot whisker plot, I just uh, plotted uh, factors that are significant at 10% level minimum. So what it means is like, you know, on this side, now shaded in green, this is positive for a farmer. This reduces your full armyworm infestation. On this red square, you know, this increases infestation and this is basically negative for a farmer. So let me walk you through this uh, graph a little bit further. What we can see is, especially with herbicide, you can see that herbicide was the largest effect in absolute value and was really reducing, the use of herbicide was really reducing full armyworm infestation. Similarly, frequent weeding were reducing fall armyworm infestation. So it seems like in this agroecology where a lot of weeds are graminaceous and we know like fall armyworm uh, is a very voracious pest that feeds on over 80 uh, species, but with a large preference for graminaceous species. So most probably having graminaceous uh, species in your field is not a very good idea for fall armyworm management. And this is probably linked, probably linked to this uh, other factor here. If your maize field follows uh, a fallow, your infestation tends to be also higher, also because fallows tend to have like, young fallows tend to be like very rich in graminaceous species. Another notable uh, fact was the fact that uh, with pumpkin uh, intercropping, infestation was significantly increased from what we found in this study. So it may be that uh, fall armyworm feeds on the pumpkins. We know this is part of the of the diet of the range of hosts from uh, from uh, fall armyworm. But most probably, uh, this was like providing a shelter to fall armyworm and maybe even facilitating migrations from uh, from a young larva from maize plant to maize plants. But this is something that requires further investigation. Conversely, uh, the presence of edge row was reducing uh, infestation, probably because of the uh, of the fact that hedgerows can host uh, natural uh, enemies. We found also a large diversity of, uh, I mean, uh, an effect of, uh, of, of um, variety, maize variety had a significant effect when compared to the CITCO 500 series as, as a control. So you can see that you could actually uh, reach lower infestation with some, uh, some uh, varieties, and this needs to be perhaps further explored in breeding program. And another interesting uh, finding from this graph is minimum tillage and zero tillage, which we found was decreasing infestation. And this also uh, echoes some uh, studies done in the Americas, in Florida and the Caribs, where uh, minimum and reduced tillage were found to actually host more natural enemies, like spiders, ants and others, and perhaps provide control, natural uh, control for full armyworm. Now looking at uh, looking at yields, so this is density plots of uh, yield uh, distribution for the total sample on the left, for Chipinge districts in the middle, and for Makoni on the right. So we see like pretty pretty good pretty good yield, a little bit higher for for Makoni. So we ran a similar multivariate uh, model. This is like a, this is a GLM in that case, trying to predict yield. So you can see damage score is at the bottom. You know I run. Uh, three different uh, different uh, models with uh, the different proxies of damage and basically uh, the best prediction was obtained by having a damage score in the model so this is the best prediction we can get so one more time uh, this is a dot whisker plot but now on this case you know these factors here uh, highlighted in red decreases your yield so obviously are, are, are negative for farmers and on this part of the graph, you know, this increases your yield and are basically having a positive effect. So what can we see if uh, I walk you through these, uh, these findings? One more time, those are only the factors that were significant at 10% uh, at minimum. We can see an effect of uh, rotation, which is usual. I mean, this is basic agronomy and fallow tend to, uh, it's tend to be good actually to follow your, 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 your crops. We find again uh, an effect on yield of, of, of varieties, but interestingly, you can see like only uh, 600 series that tended to uh, to have higher infestation, uh, to have um, uh, lower infestation. Sorry, uh, tended to have like a lower yield. So in fact, like the, the 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 connection between actually plant infestation and yield has to be explored further, and probably there is uh, uh, 
compensation happening for many varieties, including, for example, 500 series, which tended to be more infected, but in fact didn't have a, didn't result to any penalty for yield. And a very, very strong effect of plant population. You can see the whiskers uh, are, are, are very, uh, very small. So the confident interval is very small. So this was the most significant effect. Plant population was really the most significant effect on overriding, even over, overriding on, on, a, on a damage score. We found a weakly significant, uh, significant uh, effect of the damage score on yield at 10% only, much lower significance than plant population. And you can see like the whiskers actually overlapping with the zero, so like the significance is, is pretty low. But we found we found a small, a small significant effect on yield of the damage score. But as I said, plant population, if you look at, uh, at the graph A on the left, there's a very, very tight correlation with plant population uh, for grain yield and a very loose or even like no correlation at all with the damage score for grain yield. So in fact, really establishing your crop at a high, at, at, at an optimal plant population is, was really more critical than even a uh, full army worm to obtain a good yield in this particular study. So now, like with the best uh, uh, estimate possible uh, that we had, so from the model on yield, we estimated basically the yield loss uh, due to uh, due to full armyworm with the GLM model that we ran. And in fact, what we find is perhaps something much lower than previous estimates. We found like uh, for the total sample for both districts, an average yield loss due to full armyworm of nine percent, and uh, a bit of a higher uh, impact for chipping gear, about fourteen percent and around 7% 7 for, for Macaulay. So this is like the best estimate uh, that was afforded by, by our study. So to conclude, we found several factors uh, that condition full amino infestation in small order condition. I insist this is in small order conditions and not in trials. So first of all, like proper adequate weeding seemed to be like um, uh, something good actually to decrease full amino infestation. Uh, most probably because of the fact that there is a prevalence of graminaceous weeds in the agroecologies considered. But of course, maybe it could be a good idea to put those graminaceous species on the, on the periphery uh, to attract full armyworm away as a trap crop. And we know this is a principle of, uh, of the push-pull, which will be discussed later in this e conference. We found also the presence of pumpkin to uh, increase full armyworm infestation. This, of course, requires more, uh, more research. We didn't find a lot of published data on, on, on this. Uh, we know that full armyworm is uh, part of the host plant, uh, sorry, <laughs> cucurbita species are part of the host plants of full armyworm, as, uh, as you can find from the list published by CABI. Uh, but it's more likely when uh, actually there's a lot of uh, growing maize around that this was uh, not really uh, a plant that uh, full armyworm uh, was feeding on, but perhaps more a plant providing a uh, day shelter for the moth or probably facilitating, as I said before, maize to maize migration of larva. We also find some uh, maize varieties to uh, be more susceptible than, uh, than others to fall armyworm. For example, the Sidco 500 series were more susceptible, although this was the most uh, used uh, uh, varieties uh, for this particular season and for the particular district considered. And there's probably a potential for selecting for genetic resistance to fall armyworm. I mean, we know that there is a number of publications. In particular, Kumar uh, published a lot of paper on that, you know, depending on the, how hairy the, the, the leaves are, etc., to perhaps select for genetic resistance to fall armyworm. We also found that uh, minimum and reduced tillage appear to somehow control fall armyworm, and this is probably due to uh, higher densities of uh, uh, generalist predators. Uh, spiders, roof beetles, uh, ants, as found as well in uh, a, a number of studies in, uh, in Florida and in Mexico with full armyworm. And when we look at actually the impact on, uh, on yield, we found, well, infestation levels that are commensurate with the previous studies, but an impact on yield which was much lower, our, our best estimate was much lower, like 9% uh, for the total, percent, for the total uh, sample and 12 in Maconi, 5 for Chipinge. So uh, a, a much lower yield impact uh, than what previous study found. For example, uh, Day and colleague and Kumela and colleague. So we think our approach, as it was based on rigorous field scouting and uh, rigorous uh, you know, harvesting and assessment of, of, of yield using uh, quadrats, was maybe more accurate than socioeconomic surveys. 
But we know there's also a number of limitations to our own study. For instance, like the fact that scouting was done only once in the season and most probably too early uh, to correlate with uh, significant yield losses. Most of the plants were in um, V stage four or five when the, sc the scouting happened. Also, of course, we would need to repeat uh, this, uh, this study during other season. It was done only during one season, so those are really preliminary results. But it could also well be that uh, losses due to fall armyworm in Africa uh, have been overestimated. Uh, perhaps, as Peter mentioned in his presentation before mine, uh, because of misidentification of other damages and maybe even other yield re reducing factors, perhaps drought or weeds or other pests, etc. And also, a lot of studies show like the, the high capacity of maize to compensate. So, with the uh, low kind of infestation, you know, this doesn't result to um, a lot of impact on yield. And we know like for small holders, there's many other limiting factors and reducing factors, uh, starting by poor nutrition, poor plant population, as, as seen in this study, that perhaps are limiting uh, yield even more than fall armyworm infestation. So uh, to conclude, like the threat of fall armyworm is very real, but should not divert attention away from other challenges faced by small holders in Africa. Uh, as you could see from, uh, from my result, one more time, plant population, obtaining a plant, uh, 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 an optimum plant population was really key to obtain a good yield uh, in the two districts considered. This was a season with, marked by, uh, by early um, dry spell, so of course this was a, a big issue. And that's also probably why long season varieties like the Seedco 600 series uh, didn't perform that well during this season. So drought was probably uh, a very more, uh, a much more important factor uh, for yield and fall armyworm in this particular study and for those particular districts considered. Thank you very much. Great. Well, uh, thanks very much indeed, Fred. Um, excellent uh, presentation, very clear. Um, maybe we can see you again and uh, we can direct some questions uh, directly to you. Um, I was very interested, particularly in these uh, estimates that you had of. Uh, of yield loss coming out at a mean of uh, only 9%. And you, you already alluded to this, that you think that the difference with um, the 22 to 67% that has been reported before was that that was not really done on, uh, on field um, yield estimates, I think, just on, um, so estimates of loss without necessarily using uh, the same rigorous protocol. Um, I see a note here that on the online platform, other people estimating 20 to 30 percent harvest losses. Um, but I think that this is really getting to the nub of the question because, of course, you know, I myself have seen uh, some really devastating fields, uh, devastated fields of, of fall armyworm, and yet uh, in both Uganda and in, in Tanzania, and yet the overall harvest in those countries seemed to be really pretty good in the last season and, and it was hard to marry those two. Do you, so do you think that that's one of, um, one of the reasons is basically that the, the, observing, the observed damage doesn't translate into yield loss in quite the same way as we might have imagined it, it would? Yes, no, indeed. I think the, that's, uh, that's one of the issues. And uh, well, Peter mentioned that before uh, in his presentation, like there's a lot of uh, misidentification still. Um, those two uh, studies I mentioned where the, the, the estimate of yield losses were based mainly on, on surveys, you know, on socioeconomic surveys based on farmers' participation. And I feel there's an urgent need really to, uh, to use uh, some of those rigorous uh, protocols that have been now uh, agreed by most of the task forces in Africa. Uh, that's the sort of protocol we tried to use uh, there and really to try to see uh, to see uh, rigorously what's the infestation and how it correlates in terms of yield losses. Yeah, great. So <clears throat> more specific questions. So there's a, a question from Frank Akar who's asking if you could explain again how tillage influences fall armyworm infestation. So maybe you could just go over the argument again there, please, Fred. Well, what we found is that uh, uh, a lot of farmers in the, in the sample were actually plowing uh, uh, conventionally, so using like two tillage operation. Um, a lot of them were using minimum tillage, so using only one operation with shallow, shallow tillage, and uh, a, a good fraction of them also were using minimum tillage, so uh, 
conservation agriculture or whatever you want to call it, zero tillage. And we found that these factors actually um, in, in the model, at least on infestation, were uh, having a significant effect on decreasing infestation. There's a lot of literature that shows like on, uh, on plots that are not, uh, not plowed, so where minimum tillage or reduced tillage is being used, you have more uh, natural enemies, more especially like generalist predators, spiders, roof beetles, ants in particular. You have more uh, perhaps residues, you disturb your system less, and this is more friendly basically to your natural, um, to, to, to your natural enemies. So perhaps like some more biocontrol occurring uh, in, uh, in those plots that were not plowed conventionally. Yeah, it's very interesting. I think that interplay between what you're saying about the graminaceous weeds being potentially uh, uh, um, more yeah, problematic because they're, they're uh, potentially also hosts and then the influence of pumpkin and then the influence of, uh, of, of residues. I guess at the moment it's too early to say what the relative um, impacts would be on yield of these. These are, these are basically simply statistically significant effects. But we exactly. Well, really we, we can see from the model that the main effect was really the use of herbicide and, and weeding. So weeding seemed to be like the most important factor controlling in this particular model. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm putting a lot of cave hats on that. You know, this is like really for this particular season, oh. for this particular district. Weed control seemed to be like the most uh, the most significant effect uh, if we look at really the absolute value of those uh, coefficients uh, to uh, reduce fall armyworm infestation. But I mean, I think this is really useful because people are looking very much for uh, simple management strategies that they can use to to reduce the problem. And there's another qu question um, from Lisette Lacambra asking: When you say plant population, which one? gives the most yield, a, a dense or less dense, and what should be the best uh, plant population? Well, it, it all depends on the resources available, and of course in uh, more humid areas, you know, you, you, you're going to go for a higher plant population. Probably in this part of Zimbabwe, Eastern Zimbabwe, we're talking of four to five plants per square meter. Uh, some of those were much lower. If, uh, if you go back to the graphs I presented, you know, with this uh, early dry spell, it had a big effect on actually the, 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 the plant density and that was the largest actually uh, uh, factor explaining yield, uh, not full armyworm infestation in that particular case. So uh, of course it depends, you have a limited fertilizer, limited rainfall, you would go for lower densities, but you will expect something around four, four to five plants per square meter in that case, or 40 to 50,000 plants per hectare. Yeah. I was, I was actually looking at those graphs themselves because I saw some of the plant densities were going way above 60,000 plants per, per uh, hectare, which is actually very dense, particularly for, the, for Zimbabwe. What I always remember was 37,500 was the sort of the standard recommendation. Is that correct? Yeah, well, some of those plots actually, uh, especially for Marconi, were very small plots. So a chipping gear was like larger plot, but like I would say those were like gardens, really, very small plots. Uh, where where this was like not extensive uh, uh, kind of farming, but very small plots, much much better fertilized and at much uh, higher plant population. Yeah, because the yields were were really very good. I think that you're reporting. Um, other questions. Um, so I lost my thread here. Um, yeah, there's a question from Tammy Solomon. Are, are there really maize varieties that are already available that are resistant? I think this is probably a bit early. Well, there's, there's, there's a lot of work that has been done on uh, insect, re insect resistant maize. Uh, I mean, my own organization, CIMIT, has been working on this uh, for a number of years. We know there are some lines that are resistant uh, in, um, in Mexico and in uh, the Caribs where actually full armyworms come from. Uh, there's a number of initiatives now to uh, import some of these lines and to, um, to crossbreed uh, with local, uh, local varieties to get some varieties that are resistant. But we know there's a number, uh, a number of factors that are important to determine uh, full armyworm infestation, including, as I was saying, like uh, how hairy the, the leaves are, including like the production of cellulose or some varieties are better than others, you know, in um, producing uh, toxins or, or uh, being more cellulolytic than others. 
So in fact, there, is, there are some traits, but I think like it's work in progress to really uh, select for varieties that could be more resistant. But this is something that uh, some of my colleagues in the breeding department are actively working on. Yeah. So are you aware of other studies that have been done uh, which are similar to yours in terms of uh, with, with uh, detailed uh, scouting and then um, also uh, with proper yield estimates? Actually, a question from myself. To be, uh, to be honest, we are, we are publishing this uh, right now uh, with Peter. Uh, the only one I know with rigorous yield estimates and uh, rigorous uh, infestation measurement is from uh, Charles Midega and colleagues uh, in 2018, but this was on trials, not on small older, older fields. So I'm, I'm not aware of any other study in small older fields, really, not, not trials, uh, using, uh, using uh, this type of scouting method and uh, uh, accurate yield uh, estimate. So there's a, a question from uh, Yodit uh, Kebede as to whether or not any botanical is yet uh, identified uh, against fall armyworm, any botanical uh, chemical, I guess, uh, or used by farmers. And I mean, at this point, I think if, if you feel uh, you'd rather get Peter to answer, I mean, we can open up uh, with questions to both of you. That's probably better answered by, by Peter, yeah. But Peter, if you could unmute and maybe join the conversation. The question is whether there are any, uh, you know, of any botanicals that have been identified or used by farmers against uh, fall armyworm. Yes, uh, it, it depends on uh, region or country. Uh, we have the most widely used botanical in many areas um, is neem. So it can be crushed neem leaves or the extract from the seed. Yes, uh, and then uh, we we also find some people. Uh, I I have here from Southern Africa. Uh, people use pepper, even I think from Central uh, Central Africa, uh, the the chili peppers, and they are mixed, probably crushed, and then mixed with ash or even sand. So, but uh, in that case, the, the control is achieved through, if you mix with sand or ash, uh, the control is achieved through mechanical action of the ash or the sand itself. Uh, and I'm not so sure the extent to which uh, chilies uh, can do the job. So in, in summary, what we are aiming for, uh, particularly with the, the Fulham and Compact, uh, which we are leading, uh, at IITA, but we have Simit, uh, ECP, uh, then CABI and ICRISAT as the other implementing partners. We actually welcome a lot of that information from farmers. Whatever they find and if somebody can do some bit of research to get the answers, but there are just too many botanicals uh, which are there. The, the, the challenge may be if some of these botanicals are, are slow growing plants and ETC, we don't want to to have a situation whereby these are wiped out. Probably it would be more preferable if the, these botanicals are weeds. Yeah, okay, so. Can I, can I say something? Uh, ahead, maybe yeah. also an, an experience from Rwanda. I don't know if anybody from Rwanda is online, but I know like uh, extract from a uh, pyrethrum, uh, largely grown in the north of the country. Uh, there's some experience with a positive, uh, positive impact of using those extracts on, on Fulami worm from what I've heard in Rwanda. By retro. Yeah. You know, this. Well, okay. Um, I mean, I think that, that both of those are, are very interesting. I mean, I think later in the week uh, we'll come back to uh, other um, roles of um, different aspects of, of control. Um, there's a question coming online now here from uh, Vincent Barbier. We say, well, I agreed on minimum, minimum tillage, but what about weeding? If we weed more, don't we? reduce the natural enemies more. This sounds a bit controversial. So I think that's for you, Fred. Let me, let me unmute. Yes, indeed, and that's what we are trying to, um, to, uh, to tamper in the paper. We are not recommended to wipe out all the weeds, uh, of course. Uh, so there's a, there's a bit of a balance between a net, you know, net, a net effect between, uh, between these. But I think perhaps if graminaceous species are really attracting for lamyworm, having them in the middle of the field is not really a good idea, but perhaps on the border of the fields, uh, which is like a, a principle of, of, of the push-pull, is perhaps a better, better idea. But uh, definitely, I think graminaceous species, uh, to have too many graminaceous species within the field 
is probably hosting for Lamy Worm more than and, and having a negative effect more than uh, hosting a lot of uh, natural enemies controlling the Fall Army Worm. But of course, we, we need to be cautious with that, and I understand, I understand very well the comments. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the problems, isn't it? It's, it's early days, but at the same time, yeah. I guess everybody's looking for, for some things to try. Um, and on that point, actually, Linda put in a question here. Uh, what would you actually recommend, on the one hand, for farmers to do based on your results, and on the other hand, where should researchers be focusing their attention? So two different questions for the uh, farmers on the one hand and for researchers on the other. Well, yeah, one more time, those are preliminary results and we need to take them uh, with a lot of caution, but uh, we can see an effect of uh, diversification, definitely, to, uh, to, to, to get some uh, good, uh, good biocontrol. Uh, so the effect of hedgerows, the effect of perhaps like minimum tillage to host more natural enemies, uh, etc. We didn't find any effect of uh, intercropping legumes as used in, uh, in, uh, in the push-pull uh, strategy. But uh, we need also to be careful. I mean, it's always a net effect. It's a bit like uh, we, 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 with the approaches like agroforestry, you know, it's a net, net effect between the positive and the negative. And this is very, I think, uh, uh, context specific. But I think, I think uh, uh, diversification is definitely something that we could uh, we could recommend uh, from this study. Trying to uh, trying also to uh, to to choose actually varieties uh, that are suited to the area. We see that there's a big uh, varietal uh, varietal uh, uh, effect. Uh, yeah, that's what perhaps we could recommend uh, recommend for farmers. But yeah, trying to host more natural enemies. And diversification. As for as for like where research should go, I think like we need we should do something about this pumpkin issue, for instance. You know, this is something that we found, and uh, uh, we've conducted the same same study in other districts, and we found the same effect. So pumpkin seems to be um, seem to be definitely having a, having an effect on uh, on full and woman infestation. So it needs further research. Uh, same for minimum tillage and zero tillage. You know, we conducted this uh, this type of assessment on other districts, and we found also an effect. An effect of it, so we need to perhaps try to understand the mechanisms and uh, enhance it if uh, if possible. Um, Peter, would you like to answer the same question, maybe, if you've got uh, anything to add on what you'd recommend both then for farmers at the moment and uh, for researchers in terms of their attention for investigation? Yes, I would want to add. Uh, basically, I agree with what Fred has said. But I want to speak on behalf of, uh, from the side, from the angle uh, of the uh, Fulham Compact, which IITA is leading. Uh, basically, in the Fulham Compact, we are not focusing on research. We are trying to deploy, to deploy uh, uh, effective technologies or those ones which you want to check or to validate their effectiveness. So in, in the context of managing fall armyworm uh, sustainably, I believe uh, we need to change our approach. So both the farmers uh, and researchers need to, you know, to share information very, very quickly. Uh, like for instance, you, you find uh, if research goes on without consulting the farmers, uh, the farmers may, not, may end up not adopting some of the recommendations. Because like one of the major drivers uh, to the um, to the increase in fall armyworm populations is like off-season growing of maize and the non-uniform uh, planting of maize. So you have literally fall armyworm hopping from one field to the other because of these mosaics of maize plants of different uh, growth stages. But if farmers are actually told to plant uniform across a wide area. Of course, rainfall, assuming rainfall is not a limiting factor in this case, you may actually find the, the infestations get diluted. And what we find once the crops tussle, fall lamum, yes, it can damage uh, the cobs or the ears, but most of them prefer to migrate to younger crops. So this is where we can actually work together because you may come with your conclusions, but not factor in the effect of planting debt or other farmer practices. Because what we see is uh, we have a lot of abandoned fields. Uh, I've seen like here in Zimbabwe, uh, we find farmers, uh, they leave their sorghum to Ratun. 
if they're not going to utilize that field. And that becomes an excellent incubator for fallen populations of season. So, so this is where we need to be speaking to each other so that we move in unison. What do farmers do? And some of the actual methods which they are utilizing to, to control fallen worm may actually work very well, provided that information, that feedback gets back to researchers uh, quickly and they can easily or they can quickly also look at it. Yeah. So we need to work together in this case. Otherwise, if we create these silos or compartments, yeah. we'll spend so much time. Yeah. So we've got another four days to come. And, and some of the questions coming in, I think we will going to hold uh, for the other days, because I think they're more related to the, the topics there. But there's a general question here on um, the alternative hosts of fall armyworm, but particularly whether or not fall armyworm is really affecting other crops in a similar way. So things like sorghum and wheat, and actually whether um, other non graminaceous crops are affected. So I think that's something maybe that you could uh, address, Peter. Okay. Um, okay, the, what we've seen, uh, or from, if we talk of literature, Folamum is more than 80 host species, but preference is for the grasses, particularly maize. And uh, of note, uh, there may be differences in terms of uh, the actual species which was fallen when, when maize is not available. In West Africa, we have onions, we have cabbages, uh, we also have rice. Uh, in Southern Africa, not much rice is grown, uh, but we have a lot of it, okay, to some extent, grown in Malawi uh, as well. But we haven't yet pots of rice being affected. Madagascar, they grow a lot of rice under the paddy system, but the rice is not affected. So, and uh, we, but the main host which we know, besides maize, sorghum, pearl millet, or just the millet, uh, as well as uh, cotton. So, a lot of uh, the problems which farmers may actually face have to do with cotton. Because cotton, if it's left, it's not destroyed. We have strict destruction deaths, like in many countries, they've got this to try to manage pink bowen. But farmers of late may actually ignore or choose to ratoon their cottons so that they can get a quick uh, establishment. Uh, we haven't yet checked how much of that ratoon cotton is contributing to the fallen populations. But what we mostly see are these numerous islands of irrigated maize because farmers get irrigated maize that is which is grown off season because farmers get a lot of income from growing grown millies, growing mm -hmm. millies off season. So that's a major uh, incubator for fall armyworm. So if we can actually map, I was just checking some of the questions which were being asked here. If we can do special mapping of the distribution of most of these uh, off season grown maize and focus our management there off season, we can reduce the populations which then migrate out particularly those ones which are going to be carrying resistant insecticide resistant genes because we don't want the interchange of yeah. these people from one region to the other okay well it's a, a very interesting point there thinking more about the uh, management in the in the off season and um, we're going to close now for today and uh, i think i'd like to uh, you to join me in thanking our two speakers for two very uh, very insightful excellent uh, talks there's a question uh, to Fred Baudron as to when the, the, uh, the paper can be made ready, but I understood, Fred, that that's already uh, on its way, or you're, you're, uh, you, you have something to share already? Well, it's, uh, we just submitted, but we have a working paper as well that I think we can, uh, we can share, actually. We have a working paper being produced from it. Okay, so that's great. So if you can share with Linda, uh, we can then share that through the, uh, the resource page uh, with people who are on the, the conference. So I'd like to invite you all back tomorrow uh, at the same time. We've got uh, day two is basically going to focus on fall armyworm monitoring and initial responses. And we've got three talks tomorrow, one from uh, Keith Cressman from FAO, from Paul Jepson from Oregon State University, um, from Step Aston from the One Acre Fund. 
So uh, I hope you'll all be back online tomorrow. I understand we had something in the order of 90 or so people online already uh, attending the conference today. But of course, we expect many others to be watching in different time zones uh, uh, because this will be uh, available to be seen back on YouTube. So thanks very much to everybody and hope to see you all again tomorrow. Goodbye.